Hey, it's Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Ellen in Chili Philly, and today we are discussing missing gaffer's tape, buying follow spots, fine-tuning transitions, and pacing yourself all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers and Sister! Welcome, everyone, to episode 243, and fresh back from Sin City, Las Vegas, well, the three of us. <laughs> we got Steve, David, and Ellen. Ellen, you survived it. You probably had the most difficult job of the entire conference, and you made it. Congratulations. I saw her in the other conference playing Magic. She was in the final round of the Magic. Oh, Ellen, have you been able to rest at all? Yes, I have survived LDI. I am still sort of in, um, still sort of in napping mode. Um, <laughs> I took a red eye on Sunday night, which almost killed me. I'm not sure I would do that again. Um, but you know, we're really happy we did the show. I think all of the people who were there had a really great time. Absolutely, and we're already working on 2022. So, wow, uh, it was a good experience for everybody. Yeah, what do you guys think? First of all, before we get to our impressions, which I, which were very favorable, I'll tell you right now, you really pulled this one off because I have a friend who does what you do in the uh, advertising business. You know, they, uh-huh. they they basically do big, you know, they, they manage conventions, do all that, and, and they try to find, uh, you know, people to come and show their products. And she is having a hell of a job trying to do it. And she is, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. It's really hard to find manufacturers who are willing to spend money again and, and get, you know, get back into it. And I thought personally that it was a very successful show. Now, I was only there for like 12 hours. <laughs> just so everyone yeah, knows. because you had a gig Saturday night. <laughs> I had a gig Saturday night. So Lori and I drove up on, you know, we made it like two hours before our show was going to start. Uh, I had enough time to go around the floor. We got there early enough. We, I got to see the floor. And then we did the show and then we crashed on Friday night. And then first thing Saturday morning, we went home because I had a, a gig with my band on Saturday night. But I saw a lot of people in the other bars. I saw Deanna Pageant from Chauvet. Uh, she was like, you know, raving about it. So there was a lot of good stuff. So I think you should be proud of yourself, Ellen. I think uh, this was a tough one. Yeah, thank you. And I really think that part of that is um, the makeup of our industry. And, you know, a lot of people have been at LDI every year since the beginning or for the last 10 years, the last 20 years. And it is a real community. And I think that it's different from a lot of other industries. In this industry, you know, you could be working for a manufacturer one day, but also be a freelance designer and also be a distributor of some other product. And the fact that the borders opened and a lot of people were able to come at the last minute, everything sort of worked in our favor. So what do you think, Steve? Did you have a good time? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, um, that were, a couple of things struck me about LDI. And one of it was... Um, I could actually hear the people who were speaking to me because there wasn't like loud <laughs> driving music yeah. in the background. So that was kind of nice. Except the Tesla coil that interrupted every conversation. What? But is a really cool product. What's a Tesla coil? I miss this. Oh, my God. It's an incredibly loud thing that makes a giant lightning bolt. How did I miss this? You couldn't have. <laughs> I did. <laughs> that sounds like an incredible product. So it's a lightning machine. It is fan- machine. fantastic. And I think they mostly use them at like loud outdoor music festivals where the just blends into the background. It looked looked great. It was sort of wow. like a foghorn reminding us what time it was every half hour. Oh, I see. So everything just like goes to like this nuclear explosion type of look? Yes, just for a minute just and like then continues. Flash. Wow. Yeah. But it's very cool. Well, it's not a flash. It's a big old bolt of lightning that's, I don't know, what do you think, 10, 12, 15 feet long? I mean, it's pretty it, big. Yeah, it's huge. Wow. And it, it just cra- it's like a scene out of Frankenstein. It's just a huge electrical discharge in the air. Very impressive. I can't believe I missed this. I think that would have really made everything. That, that would have capped off my weekend. Seeing Absolutely. That bolt. Uh, Next time, don't miss Tesla. No, I, you, hey, I drive a Tesla. <laughs> Why would I miss a Tesla bolt? <laughs> you know, the thing I thought that was really a big hit what? were the breakout stages inside the showroom floor. Yes. And I attended two discussions. I, I went to uh, 
Ethan Steinmel's Artistic Finance, which was really great yep. to kind of tell us about how to uh, manage our money and retire. And the other one that I never thought that I would actually sit through, which was, I don't know, two hours, but really enjoyable, was the PRG discussion on troubleshooting. Yeah, well, Chris Conti is a great speaker. He really knows his stuff. And uh, that we did that session a couple of years ago, and it was so popular. People kept saying, oh, I missed it. Can you bring it back? Yeah, kudos to Chris. Oh, it was, he does it was a great standing job. room only. There were people lined up outside whatever number of chairs you had in there, which right. was considerable. Uh, there were people just gathering around listening to what he had to say. And, of course, the LDI Circle Bar. Oh, yes. yeah. That was genius, the pure genius. Bar. Well, we figured if the hard rock wasn't going to have it, we were going to have that's it. That's right. That's right. But I have one suggestion for you. Uh, next time you do that, have more bartenders. <laughs> there was this, right, one, right. This, one, this line that went in the back, and then Lori and I looked at each other, and we said, uh, no, we need a drink now. <laughs> so we went Morning. over to the hotel. But uh, yeah, that was fun. A lot of people are having a great time. People were being reacquainted after like two years. You know, a lot of people, I hadn't seen some people there in two years. Yeah. I saw Ann Militello on the floor. You know, she told me about her thing. I think it was what, Women in Lighting? Yeah, there's an organization called Women in Lighting that's based in the UK, but is very international. And Anne is a member. Uh huh. Well, she represented them and sort of did a little encapsulated history of the pioneers uh, from Loey Fuller to Jean Rosenthal to Peggy Clark to Jennifer Tipton and to the next generation. And interestingly enough, Ken Billington uh, was in the audience and he had known or worked with almost all of those women. <laughs> and he kept, you know, adding little comments. And it was it was really, really wonderful. Oh, I'm sorry I think I there's a. That big amount of work to do there to create a real archive um, about those people, the real pioneers. That's amazing. That That's really amazing. So yeah, brava on the circle bar and uh, brava on those uh, breakout rooms. And uh, we need to talk to you about uh, the um, Light Talk Lounge. Well, yes, that was, <laughs> that was funny because when I was naming those, I went, oh, Industry Biz, Light Talk. So that has a ring to it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was tempted to put a piece of gaffer tape over the S. I, I had it in my hand, but I, but, I, but I thought I'll get in trouble. Well, if we do that again next year, if you want to record live from the show floor, we'll put you in the Light that Talk That would be lounge. fun. We could do that. We should do that. Oh, I that makes- I think we do some giant combo event with artistic <laughs> finance and Light Talk and – Surely there's somebody else out there. Yeah, well, there's, there yeah there's definitely, there's Corey Paddock. Right. There's the geezers of gear. Marcel did his in a room. But if he wanted, you know, we could have a little podcast studio out there. And um, but, uh-huh. um, we had a lot of podcasts going on this year. That's really oh, cool. That's, great. that's really cool. Well, you know, it speaks to what LDI is. You know, it's more than just the showroom. People seem to forget all the educational things going on and right. everything that's going on around the, the product demonstration. Exactly. So, you know. Right. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's sort of like a magazine. If the exhibitors are the advertisements, as it were, promoting their products, the content is the articles. So it goes hand in hand with um, a publication. Uh huh. Well, again, great show, Ellen. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Thank let's you. get started, you know, with a little bit of industry news. Industry news. First, we're going to start off some, with some very sad news. Our Longtime friend Joe Tawil passed uh, last week, I believe it was. Um, on, on Friday. Yeah, right 19. before. Yeah, we just heard yeah, that. Interesting because I think he was one of the very first exhibitors at LDI. Yes. <laughs> great friend of Pat Mackay, a great supporter. Right. Uh, and then he passed on the opening day of oh. our coming back is sort of poignant. Um, he was 84. Mm-hmm. I mean, as you know, the founder of GAM. And right. I don't think there's anyone in this industry of a certain age that didn't know him. Right. Great American market. That's what it's Great American for. market, right. right? And later GAM products, right. which was eventually sold to Roscoe. Right. And, uh, you know, a GAM color book was everybody had a gel book. Uh, absolutely. And they had a great scene machine. Remember that? Yep. Mm-hmm. The wonderful. Yep. So I used I used that when I was a student quite a bit. Also, their gobos. No offense to Roscoe, but back then I preferred GAM gobos. But yeah, but so our deepest condolences to uh, Joe's family and friends. I mean, it's you know he made so many friends over the past 40, 50 years. Uh, you know, God bless him. So anyway, that's a, that's our bad news today. Uh, however, we have a little bit of good news. You know, we did our LDI show on, on the on the floor. Uh, what was it? It was Friday afternoon and we had a really yep. good crowd. 
And I don't know if you heard about this, Ellen, but we had this little competition. Everyone put questions into a, uh, a stolen ice bucket from the Westgate Hotel. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how it was stolen, but you know, I, I'm going to blame it on Lori. That's funny. And uh, we picked out eight questions. All, all those eight people got to choose a not ready for a dishwasher light talk coffee mug on the desk. So they got to choose one of them. And then at the very end of the show, there was one of them that was marked and we announced what the mark was, and whoever got that mark would win Lumen Brother or Sista of the Day, and we were going to have them on the show to co-host the show. And as it turns out, Jordan Hall, one of Brackley's students, got the winning mug. So we're really That's excited right. about that. And uh, matter of fact, all everyone was fantastic during that show. The whole audience was energized. Uh, you know, they were cheering, they were singing. Uh, it was a lot of fun. But I was so happy for Jordan. And uh, so we're going to have him on an upcoming show. And we missed you, Alan. But we all knew from the very beginning, you know, she's going to be pretty damn busy. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I mistakenly thought I could take an hour off and uh, pop in and be a sister. But, you know, one thing always leads to another. So. <laughs> Silly you. Sure. <laughs> no way that's going to happen. And here I am. Here you are. So you're making up for it today. It's, and it's great. You, all, you, you also missed the premiere of our brand new theme song. Yes. Oh. Well, it's not brand wow. new. It's a remix. Uh, one of oh, our okay. listeners, Drew Belinsky, uh, last week said, hey, you know, I was fooling around. Tell me what you think. And he recorded a piano track to the song, and the piano <laughs> sounded fantastic. So we mixed it in. I did a whole new remix of the song. So we premiered it on uh, on the uh, episode 242, which was the show at LDI. And it's right. gonna, and you're going to hear it on this one, too. So that's uh, Drew playing piano. Lori's there with a, with a vocal in there. And uh, we need to get you to vocalize, too, by the way. I don't sing. I talk. You don't have to sing. You just have to say, light, talk. Lumen Brothers. Oh, light talk. I think that. It'd okay. be great if you said, and sister. And sister. <laughs> and then I'll just put that in. That would be funny. That's okay. Funny. We'll talk about it later. Anyway, Ellen has our first listener question of the day. Okay. Deborah writes in from Atlanta. My school needs two follow spots. Should I buy two conventional follow spots or just use two moving lights? Hmm. That's an interesting question, isn't it? It sure is. <laughs> I think we all have well, opinions on this. So go ahead. I know, but does does some of that have to do with like real estate? Do they have a follow spot booth? Are they going to be in the grid someplace? Does she have room for them? Or would moving lights be better for the size of her school? Hmm. Those are those are good considerations. I hadn't even thought about that. I was thinking about something that I mean that's really practical because where are you going to put them? I have a right. I have a feeling that Deborah already has some sort of place to put follow spots. But who knows, right? I, I guess I'm just assuming that. But Ellen's correct. I mean, uh, you, if you don't have the room, the best way to go about it is using a couple of moving lights with some type of a remote system so that people can run it remotely. Like the PRG ground control. Like ground control. Um, there are a few others that are less expensive, but that's where things get kind of crazy because it starts costing you some more money. But there are some uh, products that are less expensive, but I don't know if you'd be saving money. I think that I would rather go with the better technology using this, this type of ground control system. However, that being said, there's nothing like just getting, you know, getting somebody with their hands on a follow spot because, you know, it's dependable. It's easy to make changes. That person's right there. What do you think, Steve? Well, I th I'm going to uh, vote for the moving lights. I'm, I'm going to say, you, you know, the other company to take a long, hard look at is Roby. Um, if you're going to get a couple moving lights, you grab a couple new Roby moving lights and you get their uh, – ground control system with it. So you still have a follow spot operator who can control the lights. You know, they're just working remotely. Uh, I think the advantage of the moving lights, you know, if we're not worried about budget, but, you know, a good, a good follow spot's up there in price too. You're probably looking at 10 grand for that. Um, I was looking at the, the new LED stuff from uh, Lycian and it, it was gorgeous. But with the two moving lights, maybe you don't need a follow spot on every show. And now you got two moving lights and you have an animation wheel and full color control and two gobo wheels and shutters. I mean, there's, you, you, they can be more than uh, just a couple follow spots that are operating every third show. Maybe you do get a little, you spend more, but you get more bang for your buck. Yeah. 
I think that's a great point. And now you've convinced me. <laughs> Absolutely. Go, go with the moving lights because how many musicals or, or, or shows with uh, uh, file spots are you actually going to be doing per year? You know, I mean, you don't want them just sitting there, you know, on, in their covers, right. their dust covers for <laughs> and not doing anything. Hmm. Right. Absolutely. Plus, one more thing. If you use moving lights, you're not restricted to one angle. Like uh, Ellen said, a follow spot usually goes into some, some sort of a follow spot booth, someplace that's quiet away from the audience. Uh, and that's one angle of light. It's usually relatively low, maybe like 30 degrees up. Uh, you know, uh, but if you are using some ground control system with two moving lights, you could put those moving lights anywhere and still use them as follow spots. You could have, you know, you're doing a dance concert, one in the front, one in the rear. You could do that. That's right. Or you're, or you're doing a jazz band, one in the front, one in the rear. Right. So you can have, you have a lot of flexibility there. And that Roby system is a nice system. I know you were looking at it for a while, Steve. Yeah, I think, I think uh, where I am heading is black tracks though. Nah. I think that's where I'm going to go. Yeah. I'm getting ready to design a show, a new ballet, and I'm using black tracks yeah. in that. So But that's real expensive, to, isn't it? Black tracks? Well, yeah, I th- I think everything is negotiable. Okay. I think everything you know, I mean, I go into the Tesla a lot. If it's a bad day, for, you know, if it's the first of the month, I'm not going to get a deal. If it's the 29th day of the month and that salesman hasn't sold a, a Tesla, maybe I get a little bit better of a deal. I, I think uh, what you do, I, I think if it's PRG or it is Roby or it is Black Tracks or the other three or four are out there, you have to talk to every manufacturer. You have to see every product. You have to see all the demos. I, I wouldn't take anything off the table. To you talk to your dealer network and your distributor and your distributors. I have Perry in California, and Perry writes: When a transition, like a complicated scene shift, does not go as planned, who takes the lead to make it happen? Well, <laughs> you know, let's talk about scene shifts. You know, who does the scene change? You know, and usually that's the stage management team are responsible for a smooth execution of scene changes. You know. Uh, very often, they organize that with the crew and the, and the TD in uh, tandem in the back. They are taking notes on everything that's happening to make sure it happens in a certain way. Sometimes, the, if, if the actors are engaged, then sometimes the director is running around the stage. Also, uh, if things aren't working well, then people are putting their heads together. Maybe this needs to go first or that actor needs to do something later. Uh, scene shifts are, are really complicated. I think uh, when you're doing a scene shift, the thing you kind of want to avoid, uh, Perry, is, is you want to avoid when the scene ends, you want to avoid uh, going to a blackout and then turning on the blue work lights at a really low level. And then you want to avoid the stage crew walking out there and shuffling around on stage trying to find their spike marks. Uh, and then you want to avoid turning the blue lights off again, going to yet another blackout. Uh, and then the actors walk in, and then the lights coming out. You know, I've never seen that in all my years of theater. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I've just blocked it out. You know, that is the most common you know, scene shift transitions you've ever, I've ever seen. It's awful. It is why we have a tech rehearsal. That's right. <laughs> it, it, it is why the crew deserves a chance to get it right, as opposed to kind of fighting their way through it. I mean, it comes down to you know really good scene shift is uh, you could you could if you want to get like you know real current you could do your scene shifts in previs or you could just take a white model and have scale pieces of the set and move those pieces off into the wings and and see where things fit and where things don't fit uh, but it has to be it has to be practiced and laid out as opposed to saying well we'll figure it out at tech or it, or what's worse is the chair comes off stage and they put it in three different locations, <laughs> you know, or, or a hand prop comes off and it doesn't go back to the prop mm. table. It's just got to be organized. I believe transitions separate the uh, professionals from the hacks. And I'm talking about lighting designers. 
Lighting is this one element, but it's probably the most effective element of scene shifts and transitions. And uh, even though we have planned it out, you know, we all say, okay, the lights are going to go down and do a focus right. We're going to start the scene shift stage left, and the truck is slowly going to move off stage left. And then this person's going to, you know, the actor's going to move down stage. It's going to be picked up by a special. And then the rest of the other truck moves off, and the, and the new scenery moves on. You know, we, we plan that out. And that's something that's all planned out uh, from the very beginning, before you get in the text. And even though it's planned out, sometimes it does not go correctly. <laughs> I mean, there could be a problem with getting the furniture on. There may be a drop problem that now it's impossible because the drop has to wait I mean, to the truck to go off for it to come in. Uh, even though you think about it in, in advance, sometimes you're making some adjustments to the line sets and, you know, that drop now won't clear the truck and now you're going to have to change it. And it's up really up to the, you know, in my experience, it's up to the team that's there at the tech table, right? And the stage manager is part of that team, a very important part that team, by the way, because sometimes it's calling a light cue a little later or a little earlier or getting that um, stage man, that artist off stage faster or whatever. Um, so it's you have to be able to think quickly at the table and say, OK, what if we lag this cue? Right. We, we Instead of it being a seven count, we make it a 10 count and then you call it on this note right here on this bar. And then that truck can start moving on a little faster. Or it could even come from the set designer, or it could come from the even the the, uh, the director. Sometimes will solve the transition problem, but this does happen, and that's why I say this is where the professional lighting designers earn their money. And this is something that Steve Strawbridge used to do brilliantly. Uh, I'm sure he still does it brilliantly, <laughs> but I when when I actually watched him work, I couldn't believe the the type of problem solving that he would create just in the moment. It was amazing what he could do. And uh, I think with experience, you get better, 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 better. But you really have to look at uh, the scene shift or the transition holistically in order to make it happen. You know, as Broadway shows get so complicated and stuff with so much automation, you know, in Lion King, there's that giant scenic piece, I think it's called Pride Rock, that comes up. And I would imagine that maybe once a year it just gets stuck. Or there was an <laughs> Aladdin show at Disney and there's a giant jaw thing that opens as they go into the cave. And sometimes that didn't work or the magic carpet got stuck. So, you know, then what do you do? Right. You have <laughs> well, you know, the people who do this really well um, is Cirque. Cirque does these scene changes really well and how they stage them. How they, You know, if you look at there's a, a, a DVD, The Making of Call. And part of that is how the TD has handled all of those shifts that have to happen. And they have it down. You know, we got eight seconds to do this. We have 32 seconds to do this. And they, they stage it as clearly as the act on stage has been staged. Cirque does it really well. And they've got usually about 14 other characters on stage doing things. So you don't even right, realize right. so much what the technical change has been until all of a sudden there's acrobats in the air above your head. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's great when you have like all those people <laughs> that are so talented, yep. you, you know, you're talking about technology, you know, and how that has both complicated things and made them easier, but, you know, doing effective scene shifts go way back, way back to like the great Broadway musicals of the fifties and sixties. Uh, even though, you know, we, we just had lighting control and, and we had, you know, scenery that would truck on and off or fly in and out. Um, the masters of doing that were people like Bill and Jean Eckhart and Theron Musser, right? I mean, uh, and George Abbott, who was the, the, the director of that team. And they would create the most marvelous scene. I mean, they look so seamless, all those scene shifts and all those transitions. And I must tell you, I was very fortunate to have learned under Bill and Jean that I was, uh, I, I saw how clearly you have to think about it when you're in a rehearsal. And that is, I think, what this question's about, is how you handle it on the spot in a high-pressure situation. Yep. And our musicals have changed a lot, too, uh, taking nothing away from Bill and Jean. But, you know, we had, the, remember the days of the mighty N1? Right. And all of a sudden a drop comes in and there's the little scene down there while the magic is happening behind it. And if you look at some of the great opera houses, there's a whole set oh, setting absolutely. off stage yeah. that can be tracked on while another one's being pulled yeah, off. Yeah, stage left, stage right, uh, upstage and downstage and down. I work in these opera houses all the time and an entire set can like sink down 
to the basement and the set rolls on top of it. Yeah, I mean, that's great. But on a Broadway, in a Broadway house, there's this great short video about the, um, the scenic design on um, Beetlejuice. And, and David Corns is explaining that how they do the scene shifts. And because that Broadway house, the theater is, you know, not this huge theater with wing space and backstage, they actually fly the scenery out. They roll it, they truck it left, and they hook it up, and it flies out on winches. And it just stores up in the air. Yeah, do you remember Sunset Boulevard? The same thing. Amazing. Pretty cool. If you ever want to have some excitement, go backstage during a major opera, right? If you know someone, don't, don't, don't get on stage, <laughs> but watch. Because during the scene shifts, there's a choreography. And if you're not in a certain spot at a certain time, you could be trapped by, you know, tons of scenery. As, a, as an assistant line designer, I would have to make sure that all the uh, floor lights were focused correctly before the next act would go up or the next scene, actually. And there was only seven, what, like, like, I don't know, 43 uh, seconds of music to do this. So I would have to move from this point on stage to that point on stage, this point on stage, just to avoid not getting locked in so I can actually do the light check. <laughs> It was nuts. It was crazy, but a lot of fun. Well, you are listening to Light Talk. And today we are sponsored by Better Than Nothing Industries. Do you find yourself at load in asking, where is my gaffer tape? Then you need Gaffa No Go. Gaffa No Go is the eight foot training leash for your roll of tape. Just clip the no go device onto your work belt. Attach your tape and never worry again. That's right. Every time your tape starts to wander off, if you know what I mean, a quick pull and gaff and no-go brings it right back. If you like that, then you'll love the Octopus, an eight-armed version of the no-go. Just hook up your loading crew and they will follow you around like a pack of hungry hound dogs. While you're at it, ask about Jaws, our adjustable wrench. It works on both metric and imperial nuts and bolts. Never carry two sea wrenches again. Shipping now for Hanukkah. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And now, back to Light Talk. Well, the sound of those rabid ducks means that once again, it's time for Let's, Let's talk, talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is all about how do you use staging rehearsals to evolve your design? Hmm. So understand what staging rehearsals are. I mean, that's a term that's used in opera a lot. But also, it's, you could call it blocking rehearsals if you're in theater or whatever. But the question is, is, A, how much time do you spend in staging or blocking rehearsals? And B, how does that help your, to evolve your design? What do you think, Steve? If I can, I spend every minute of my life in staging rehearsals. And I'm sitting there with a notebook and I am sketching. And I am all of a sudden sketching that scene and I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, they're coming from stage right. Do I want them to walk into light or walk out of light? I'm starting to, to draw in how the cue that the director and I have talked about is going to evolve as his or her blocking uh, evolves at staging rehearsals. Because so much of this has to be ready before you get to that point. The staging rehearsal is really important to me. It's where, if I have the time, it is where I really learn um, the subtleties of the show. And it helps me so much. It's just, I, I really get to know the show through the staging and blocking rehearsals. Would you ever take a computer with a previs into those rehearsals? Um, no, because I'm not fast enough mm -hmm. uh, to use a computer and previs at blocking rehearsals. I'm, I'm just not fast enough. But I'm pretty fast with a pencil. Okay. Um, and I can sit there and, and really go to town. Um, you know, a few years ago, I went out to visit uh, a friend in California who does um, a lot of television. And he's probably in his 80s now. Uh, but he was, I mean, he was sketching and drawing masterpieces. Uh, he was working on a production of Guys and Dolls. And his sketches had 
human figure actors dancing in them. I mean, he was incredible. He was like, he's like the, he was like those guys, you know, on uh, the boardwalk that do the caricature of you in five minutes. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd never seen anyone sketch as well as him. I mean, it was inspirational. But yeah, um, previs is great. I'm just not fast enough to do it live. You know, I must agree with you, Steve, that uh, I would spend as much time as possible as well. As a matter of fact, probably <laughs> the most common argument I get in with producers and production managers is about when I arrive in the town. Because normally they, they, they want the light designer to arrive like one day before focus. And that's too late. And I tell them that. I said, no, 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 no. Uh, back up at least a week. Because that is where you learn about the show. You learn it in blocking and staging rehearsals. And the show is evolving. Because what you and the director were talking about three months earlier, as soon as they, as soon as they get into the rehearsal room, and they even, even that first read-through of the script, things are changing. Things are evolving already. So I highly recommend if, it's, if you're uh, doing a show and you're in town for, make sure you're there for that very first read through and sit in as many rehearsals as possible. I've mentioned this on the show before. I'll just mention it quickly again. When I go into a, a rehearsal room, I look at the tape on the floor at the, where the set is and I sit down and I visually create that set in my mind. And that set is always there. And as the actors walk through a door, I see them walking through the door. Uh, th this is just something I've always done. And then I create lighting over it. I say, okay, I know this is going to be a very, very uh, sultry look. So it's going to be very dark and dingy. And I see it. I, I imagine it in my mind. And then I see how it works with the design, with, with the actors, how they're relating with that light. And uh, I know if there's like a light coming through a window, I see that light coming through the window. And I'll tell the, the, the stage director, I say, you know, if that... You know, if that actor moved down stage three feet, they'll be in this great light coming through that window. And this, and again, not all directors think like this. And they say, oh, you're right, David. We talked about that window light. Well, I saw it because I was watching it and I saw that light, you know, in my, my mind's eye. So that's how I use staging and blocking rehearsals because you just learn about it. And, and there's nothing wrong with changing your design. That's really the beauty of what we do as lighting designers. It, we're able to be flexible all the way to opening night. You know, if you're a set designer or a costume designer, there's very little you can do except for cutting things. Uh, you know, they're not going to build a whole brand new costume unless they have, <laughs> there's a lot of money in the budget. So as line designers, we can make those changes. I was just thinking your uh, discussion about the director, you can take that a step further, too. I think when you're working with a highly skilled acting company, you know, we forget uh, the actor also walks on stage and says, you know, Mr. Or Ms. Director, if I walked downstage, then the next cross up stage, all of a sudden really skilled actors bring five or six ideas into the blocking rehearsal. Also, I encourage my students to you know, take a tripod in, throw uh, an iPad on it and also uh, tape record what they're seeing. Certainly if they're at uh, stage rehearsals for dance. Go in there and record that thing so you can look back at it at your, at your leisure. So spend as much time in rehearsals as possible. I believe we all agree on that. David has our last question. <laughs> well, Roger in Miami writes, what techniques do you use to pace yourself during 10 out of 12s? Hey, that, 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 they said the dirty word. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> a loaded word. question. <laughs> well, that yes, that is a very loaded question. You know, um, USITT recently did a webcast called No More 10 Out of 12s. And a lot of people in the industry feel that, um, you know, 10 out of 12 rehearsals, six day work weeks uh, have always been sort of part of the deal. But that people, I don't know, did they take pride in pushing themselves far beyond their physical and mental limits? Or is it something that should really be evaluated and, and not happen? Well, let, let me just say one thing to throw in the conversation, too. At the university, when I'm training young designers, what I find is a 10 out of 12 is not helpful because uh, even the most um, dedicated of them start fading after about seven hours. And, and they, they just get tired. They get its sensory overload. It just, you know, it just keeps coming at them. So uh, at least on the university level, I, I do not see the 10 out of 12 as being something that is healthy. 
either mentally or physically for them? Well, you know something? When I was helping my friend out down at USC last weekend, and we were doing, they weren't 10 out of 12s, they were 14 out of 16s, which are basically what 10 out of 12s are for the, for the tech, for, for people who are involved in technical rehearsals. Uh, not the actors, but the uh, technicians and designers and stage managers. Um, after the dinner break, I was done. I couldn't see anything. And my, my eyes were just tired. I, and, and I did everything that I'm about ready to suggest you doing for these long days. Because even if they abolish 10 out of 12s, you're still going to be tired. There's still going to be days where you're really, really tired. And I think that's where this uh, question is leading to, is uh, what techniques do you use uh, to pace yourself? Um, and I have four very important things I use to, to pace myself during tech rehearsals. Uh, long days. One is rest. That means when you go out at night after a long day, you don't go to the bar and stay there for two hours and then get four hours of sleep and then come back into the theater at 8 a.m. in the morning. Uh, that is crazy. There, you're going to just hurt yourself. If you want to be sociable, go to the bar, right? Have a, have a glass of water, right? Don't have a vodka, even though I sometimes have vodkas. If I know I don't have to be early in the morning, I, I may. But uh, rest. You must find your rest. You must get at least six hours of sleep at night. Um, no alcohol. I, I think that if you drink a lot, that's a big mistake for so many reasons. First of all, if you, if you start drinking and everybody sees you drinking, and then the next day you are not at the top of your game, they're going to think it's because of your drinking problem. And uh, I, I, I think that's a really bad way to start your career, okay? You don't want to be known as that type of person. You don't want to. You, you have to be at the top of your game. Because like we mentioned earlier with transitions, you know, all of a sudden the transition's not working. You better come up with that solution now. You know what I mean? If you're slow, that's going to be a problem. Eat well. That means eat healthy foods and, and not junk you know, make sure you eat a good dinner, a good breakfast, and a good lunch. Don't just go out and, you know, say, okay, I'll just have a cafe con leche or whatever. You know, have something substantial. Have some chicken or have some, you know, some fruit or have some uh, uh, vegetables, right? And then the final thing, believe it or not, is Ambien. <laughs> That's only for me when I'm overseas because I have terrible, terrible jet lag. And Ambien actually saved my career. Because I don't, the next morning I get, a, I get a full night's sleep and the next morning I feel super refreshed. How about you? Do you have any techniques? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, Ellen, you've had long nights like that. Well, you know, oddly enough, I need eight hours of sleep. So I have to subscribe to the don't get into the fear of missing out. You know, right, no right. FOMO. <laughs> if everybody's going someplace after a long day at LDI and it's already nigh on 11 o'clock, I'm going home. I just cannot you know, function the next day if I don't get eight hours of sleep. Right. So uh, I don't go to the clubs. I don't go to a lot of late night things. I just can't. Um, you know, when you're 20 years old, I guess it's a little different. But even those kids need to pace themselves if they're going to do a good job. Exactly. Exactly. Again, you don't want to be known as that person who's like partying at night. You know, right. you're there for a job. They're paying a lot of money for you to get there and, and put you up and all that. And uh, right. if, you, if you're out there and you're, you know, you're, you're too much of a social butterfly, then, uh, and then and you just make one mistake. That's all it takes. One little mistake. And all of a sudden, oh, my God, yeah, I guess he didn't get enough drink, uh, sleep last night. He was drinking vodka all night long. Right. Especially now that safety, you know, on stage and safety on the set are such major considerations. If you're tired, you're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. So eat your Wheaties <laughs> and, and make sure you have food at the table. That's very important and good food too. Like our tech table turkey loaf. That's for next week. There you go. Whoever needs get something to eat. Light talk. We have it. Tech table turkey That's loaf. Nice. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every other podcast site out there. Check out our website on LightTalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. 
However, if you do decide to litigate, the law firm of Fleck, Block, Blair and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers and Sista, coming to you from Long Beach, Philadelphia, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to join us next week when we chat about more useless things and explore the crazy shenanigans in our industry. Light Talk, broadcasting questionable Lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Toodles. Bye.